Hello, I'm Professor Stephen Abbott. My free ebook, The Fact and Science Principles and Practice, is linked to a large series of apps on my Practical Surfactants website. In this video, we use the apps to look at foam science, and we finish with the perfect latte. In this final video, we look at some of the resources available on foam science within Practical Surfactants. The starting point is foam elasticity. The more elastic the foam, the more resistant it is to problems in life. And this is highly related to the isotherm plot we saw in the CMC discussions. The surface excess makes a big difference to the elasticity. The CMC makes some difference. The thickness of the foam layer makes a difference and the equilibrium value makes a difference. And what you want to do is make sure that your foam has the maximum elasticity at the concentrations you are dealing with so it's as tough as possible or if you want it to be anti-foam you need to make sure you're at a concentration or whatever where it's minimized. Foams can be stabilized by DLVO and that depends on the concentration of the electrolyte. It depends on the potential of your foam. So Anionic foams tend to be more stable than non-ionic foams because there's a repellency value. And the DLVO is showing you the net force, which is in green, and it's made up of the attractive force, which is the van der Waals attraction, which depends on the Hamaker constant. And it depends on the steric force here in red, which depends on the length of your surfactant molecule and it depends on the electronic force in yellow. So these forces combine to give you the net. And again, you can work out how to make your foam bubbles as stable as possible with a big DLVO potential, or you can make sure that they are as unstable as possible. The foams will pop as much as possible if you want anti-foam behavior. If you start with a foam, with bubbles of this sort of size and leave it around for a while, then the average size grows and the width of the distribution grows. And this is asphalt ripening. Now, why would you be interested in the asphalt ripening of foams? Well, if you drink Guinness beer, you know that the head lasts a long time and that's because the head contains a lot of nitrogen which happens not to diffuse so quickly through the foam, and therefore the asphalt ripening, which kills the foam on the beer, takes place much more slowly. Normal beers just have CO2 in there, which goes very quickly, and asphalt ripens quickly. What else can we do? There's foam drainage which says, if I have a head of foam and leave it some time, what happens to that uh, head of foam? And uh, as you change things, all sorts of things uh, change, but really it just depends on whether it's channel dominated or node dominated, all of which are explained in the app. There's foam rheology, which tells you how the viscosity changes depending on shear rate and things like that. There's a big section on anti-foams, but my favorite section is the one with which we end all these videos. Taking into account all the science of foams and anti-foams, how do you get the best espresso? How do you get the best crema on top? And how do you get the best latte foam? And one of the secrets of why an espresso can give a crema, it has lots of oil that should kill the foam, but these oil particles sit in the borders of the foam and don't actually break it. And this is also very important for real anti-foam science. So with that, we end the tour of foams and these videos of extracts from practical surfactants.